Good afternoon and welcome to Finance and Funding Once in a Lifetime Challenges. I'm Judith Patton, Project Director of All Energy and Decarbonize and co-creator of the event that was first staged in 2001. Nowadays, I primarily create the conference, which under normal circumstances has around 600 speakers over two days each year. In the new normal, I'm really having fun creating webinars. A little like actors calling one of Shakespeare's plays the Scottish play, I'm going to say that with this webinar, we've reached our baker's dozen, just in case the number after 12 is unlucky in any way. The ongoing series has already attracted something like 8,700 registrations since May. It's great to welcome so many of you here today. I would like to imagine that you're sitting in the Lomond Auditorium at the SEC in Glasgow, home of our live show. I can assure you that from where I'm standing behind my imaginary lectern, that huge theatre is very comfortable looking. 320 registered to join us. So enjoy it. I, w I was delighted when a good friend, a very good friend to all en energy, Andrew Smith of Greenbackers Investment Capital, agreed to chair this session and work with me on the recipe as far as our topics and panel were concerned. And what a splendid lineup we have. If our session last, last week, when we all got together, is anything to go by, we're all in for a very interesting and rewarding 90 minutes. I think you'll find their enthusiasm and passion infectious. Before I pass over to Andrew to chair the session, there's a tiny bit of housekeeping. There'll be a poll during the webinar to take part in it. If you're on full screen, you'll have to minimize it to see and click on the word vote. And can we ask you too to look out for rate this? That's where you can not only rate the webinar, but also feed in your comments about other webinars you'd like us to hold in the coming months. Perhaps you'd like to sponsor one that we're already working on, or come up with your own idea for us to work on together. Your questions to the panel obviously go where it says questions. You can see just my one slide, the URL telling you where to find today's presentations. They're bottom right on that page and also where to find this and our other 12 webinars and to use the free on-demand facility. Spread the word. Now, with yet another heartfelt word of thanks to all of the panel, I'd like to pass over to Andrew and get this webinar on its riveting road. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Judith, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, uh, in, a, in the series of fantastic all energy webinars. We hope we can um, uh, reach the, the heights of the, the early ones. It's been a fantastic series. I would uh, uh, like proceedings over the next 90 minutes just quickly for you. Um, I'll make some brief opening remarks um, and then introduce the uh, fantastic panel uh, one by one. Uh, they will uh, be making some uh, opening remarks of, of their own. Uh, one or two will have uh, very short slide decks to share with you. But we've deliberately shaped uh, to today's event uh, not to have too many slides. Uh, we are very hopeful uh, that you will uh, challenge us with your questions, that you'll take advantage of the excellent expertise we have around the virtual table here um, and, and put some uh, challenging issues uh, before us. Um, uh, after the uh, last of the panelists has made their opening remarks, uh, I will uh, go into uh, a Q&A session. Of course, I have one or two topics I'd like to try and cover, uh, but your own questions will take priority over that, of course. Um, my name uh, is Andrew Smith. Uh, thank you very much to Judith Patton for her introduction and for this opportunity. Um, I'm from uh, the Greenbackers Investment Capital Business. Um, we help businesses find funding and finance. Um, one uh, quick bit of editorial, uh, we have a, an excellent uh, pitching session coming up ourselves, which is going to be online uh, in November, and, and you can 
get access to that uh, via our own Green Mappers website. But enough of that. Um, what I'd like to do now um, is, is uh, name the uh, panel members here. Um, we have uh, David Richardson from Innovate UK. We have Matthew Clayton from Thrive Renewables. Veronica Noon uh, from uh, Essie's Low Carbon Transition Team. Uh, Louise Wilson, the uh, co-founder and joint MD of Abundance, and Fraser Pritchard uh, from Columbus Energy. Um, hello, everybody, and, and thank you very much indeed uh, for, for joining me today uh, for the session. Um, I, I'm sure we'll have a, have a good time, and uh, I hope you all have fun doing this. Um, thanks for all the efforts you've, uh, you've made in, in putting your presentations uh, and thoughts together. Um, what we're going to be talking about um, is, is that amazing uh, set of ingredients that we're now faced with as, as entrepreneurs, as funders, as, as people trying to help finance and fund um, solutions. Uh, we have, of course, the terrible uh, pandemic. Uh, we have uh, some very interesting political times associated with that. Uh, we have a, a genuinely difficult investment background. Uh, but the experience around our virtual table hopefully can uh, lead us through that and guide us through all of that and get some really good tips coming out of, out of today, I hope. So um, without further ado, what I'd like to do is, is introduce the first of our speakers today, um, and that is uh, David Richardson. Uh, David is the Innovation Lead for Energy Systems from Innovate UK, uh, and uh, he uh, uh, is focused on supporting companies to develop innovative uh, low carbon technologies and services. Um, there are full details of each of our speakers on the All Energy website, so I don't want to just uh, repeat those. So, if I may ask uh, David, you to uh, kick us off uh, this afternoon with your uh, initial thoughts, please. Thank you very much. So, for anyone who's not familiar with Innovate UK, where the UK's innovation agency responsible for business-led innovation across all sectors, from healthcare to entertainment and various forms of infrastructure. But as Andrew said, I'm responsible for energy systems innovation. And in particular, I, I work delivering a portfolio of projects across a large innovation program called Prosperum from the Energy Revolution, which was a hundred million pounds of public funding with about a similar amount matched um, privately by the businesses that are delivering that program. Uh, I've also been closely involved in the setup and delivery of the Energy Data Task Force and subsequently implementing the recommendations of that to accelerate the move to a more data-driven and digitalized energy system. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some of the things we've been doing and in particular around public and private partnerships um, for financing that we've been carrying out in, in the recent years. So one of those is our innovation loans program. Traditionally, we're known for giving grant funding for um, collaborative research and development, but the innovation loans program was really looking at bridging the gap from publicly funded grant funding to a um, the growth and scale journey of a company and they provide grant um, innovation loans of around um, 250,000 to 1.5 million um, to allow businesses that aren't quite at the stage that they can secure private loans to be able to grow and scale their innovation particularly where there's a, a manufacturing element to it. Another piece of work that we've done is introduced investment accelerator pilots and those are processes where we run a competition much like our other funding mechanisms and we provide a short list of projects that we believe are high potential um, both from a business growth perspective and our other objectives of decarbonization and improving societal needs as well and then we partner with private investors who will match our funding to the company um, in return for equity in that company and that's again to try and bridge that gap between publicly funded projects to private investment. That's something that Bayes has also started exploring now and they've recently um, launched a 
Clean Investment Fund, Clean Growth Investment Fund, so you might be interested in having a look at that. Um, and we're starting to look at how we can really improve our relationships with private investors as we start to scale up um, really to achieve what we need to for the energy transition. So some of the things we're starting to explore now is how do we improve visibility of both our businesses and our projects for investors. And that's not just um, the names and scope of the, those projects, but also what are their business models? What kind of metrics can we start developing out of our innovation projects, which really improve the investment case for private investors? Another important part of my work is looking at the regulatory and policy conditions, which are going to be vital to scaling um, investment and private finance. And really, I think we are starting to see that over the next few decades, we require a more agile and fast moving regulatory environment, which is able to respond to the new business models that are emerging in the energy sector and also provide some certainty for investors, um, which is difficult as we go through a period of quite dramatic change, um, only compounded by COVID-19, really. Um, the final thing that we're, we're looking at is traditionally investment has typically been done on a business basis, but a lot of our projects now require a broad range of organizations to deliver them. Um, typically, we have consortiums which might involve technology development companies and SMEs, partnering with distribution networks, with local authorities, and a whole range. And really, that provides a new investment proposition because the interlinkages between transport and heat and local authority um, administered areas of the energy system, like social housing, etc., mean that the, the business model doesn't necessarily work unless all those organizations are involved. And what we're trying to explore is how do we package that into an investment proposition that private finance can get behind. Um, typically, when I, I talk at conferences, one of the first questions is, OK, what money have you got available? So um, I wanted to more talk to you briefly about the mechanisms we have in place, but I have drafted a document which summarizes all the places you can go to find innovation funding from Innovate UK and UKRI, which is UK Research and Innovation, as well as a lot of the other organizations which are crucial and key in delivering innovation funding across the UK, which all share um, and that will be provided to you in the chat shortly. So that's all from me and thank you for inviting me. Excellent David, um, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I think that's uh, the first uh, piece of value add uh, from uh, the session today. Uh, we hope of course to, to have uh, more and more of those as the session progresses. Um, so uh, to be clear, the, uh, the links that uh, David was just referencing uh, will be coming up on the screens um, during the, the uh, event today, uh, and you'll be able to take uh, take details from them. If, if you can capture them from there for some reason, we'll make sure that uh, they, they are available to you through the website to uh, post the event. Uh, David, uh, th thanks very much for that. I am uh, sorely missing the Innovate UK Business Breakfast that uh, was always a feature at, uh, at All Energy. I, it was so good that I managed to drag myself uh, from my own bed uh, uh, very ridiculously early hour to attend. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get back to those soon. And uh, Absolutely. I think yeah, we'll the, yeah, go on, sorry. Made the journey from Exeter to Glasgow worthwhile at breakfast. <laughs> well, indeed, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, David, for those uh, opening remarks. Much obliged to you. Um, so uh, next, uh, uh, to, to make a few opening remarks for us uh, this afternoon, um, we've got uh, Matthew Clayton, who's the Managing Director of uh, Thrive Renewables, formerly, of course, uh, Triados. Uh, uh, once again, all of Matthew's details, of course, are, are on the All Energy website. But just to mention a couple of things, uh, Matthew, not to embarrass you, but during your time there, there's been some amazing growth in the company, I think something like 15-fold since you've been there. Of course, naturally all down to you and not down to any of your team or colleagues at all, naturally. Um, anyway, uh, what I'd like to do now 
is uh, is hand over to you and, and hear what you've got to tell us. Uh, I, I, and just before I do so, that just to point the audience to the All Energy website once again, where there is an excellent blog uh, from one of your colleagues, and that's available to consume and uh, and read right now. Um, Matthew, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm hoping there's a slide deck being shared as I speak. Um, is that working? Yes, there we go. Great, thanks very much. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks, Andrew, for the intro. Um, yeah, obviously, yeah, 15-fold growth, single-handed effort, no support from a great team at all. Um, but thanks very much, colleagues. Um, yeah, and so today I just thought we'd just provide a really bit of, a small bit of context around who Thrive Renewables is, um, but importantly then move on to um, a bit of um, just talking you through some research we've done recently um, in the wake of the, the COVID crisis, which um, for us really gives us a feel for, for the, the sort of the size of both the, the opportunity and the challenge um, ahead of us. So yeah, we'll, we'll go through that um, over the next few minutes. So for those of you who don't know Thrive Renewables, we're a renewable energy investment company. Um, we've now invested in 25 renewable energy projects dotted around the UK. That's about 120 megawatts of capacity. Um, we currently own and own or fund 15 projects um, in the UK, and um, very happily at the moment we're building a further three um, uh, currently. So it's uh, it's been a fun time to be building a renewable energy project over the last few months, as I'm sure many of you are experiencing as well. Um, so in terms of the context for the company, um, we invest between 500,000 and 15 million into individual projects. And what we like to do is um, plug funding gaps. So we work really closely with developers, businesses, communities, and local authorities um, to get the next project, you know, to provide the funding to get the next renewable energy project built. Um, and I guess what makes us a little bit different is the way we're capitalized or the way we're funded um, in that we unite, or we now unite a, a crowd of over six uh, and a quarter or 6,250 individuals who've invested in us and then we have aggregated that capital and gone out and built the projects we've built. Um, and we're very proud of the, the diversity we have in that, that crowd of investors um, from the smallest investor being a five pound investment um, right the way through to five and a half million pound investment. So we really unite a, a wide group of both individuals and institutions um, who um, yeah, want a rewarding connection with addressing climate change and, and that's what we deliver. So for, if you're a project developer, then um, we acquire from you, we'll invest with you, we'll do a joint venture with you, or we'll provide um, um, funding bridges to help get projects built. So that's um, enough about Thrive. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So I'm struggling with the technology a bit. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned at the beginning, we did a little bit of research um, in the wake of the COVID crisis um, to look at you know, what kind of impact or, uh, the, or what kind of um, opportunity um, renewables could, could, could deliver in, in the context of building back better. And we're already conscious that, and, and you'll be very familiar with that, you know, renewables is already delivering a third of the UK's electricity Crucially, from the environmental perspective, you know, renewables has been has contributed very largely to halving the carbon content of each unit of electricity we use in the UK. So we thought we'd look at um, through the onshore renewable lens. Um, so looking at wind, onshore wind, solar, and hydro in particular, and the role that, that those technologies have in in building the economy back better. And we anchored it round around um, the um, 2050. A net zero target, which is a firm target which has been set by the government, and really focused in on what we as an industry need to deliver um, by 2035 for us to be on the pathway to deliver the 2050 targets. So basically our 14 years of, of um, hard graft to get us on track for, for delivering net zero. And I guess the, 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 the other context or the backdrop for that is that over that period, um, because of what we anticipate in terms of the growth in um, electricity demand, principally from the electrification of transport from road and rail, um, and also the electrification of heat and, and hot water and, um, from the, 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 the um, residential side, then we anticipate a two and a half times or two and a half fold increase in um, the electricity demand. Um, in the UK context and consequently we see that there's a 
a two and a half fold increase um, in electricity generate or the requirement for electricity generation from onshore renewables over the next 14 years, which equates to about five and a half gigawatt hours of new capacity annually. And when we put that in the context of what went or what received planning in the last 18 months, um, the projects that received planning in the last 18 months reflect or represent a third of what we need to deliver to be able to, to get on that trajectory. So we've got a little bit of work to do. So the big figure in terms of what, what the new capacity that needs to be built um, over the next 15 years uh, on the onshore side is 47 gigawatts. And we've, um, we've boiled that down into using the current market pricing in terms of technology cost and capex, and therefore the opportunity for investment. And that, that boils down to a nice round 66 and a half billion pounds worth of investment um, between now and 2035. And what's really good is if you look at even the, if you look at the way that 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 66 million um, sorry billion um, can be spent, then from from what happens to the current portfolio of renewable energy projects in the UK, we can see that 28.9 billion of that will reside in the UK. So the UK content of that 66 billion is 28 billion, which is obviously what we really need in terms of building back um, better and seeing that opportunity. And actually that's just the development cap the development and the capital expenditure. And through the operational life of those projects, that figure that the proportion grows from about 45% UK content to about 65% UK content for onshore renewables. So a growing contribution to the UK economy. And very usefully, um, particularly at the moment for those who've been affected um, you know, by the COVID crisis, then, we, we see that as being an extra 3,000 jobs per annum, so 45,000 jobs over the period. So, um, yeah, a lot to play for there. So I guess the obvious question is, why isn't that happening already? And I guess to a large extent it has been. I mean, the rate of deployment we've seen over the last um, 10, 15 years in the UK has been astonishing, and we've seen that massive change in the carbon content and the contribution renewables is making. But obviously there's still a lot of work to be done. So um, I'm keen that we're not saying to uh, the government, which is um, doing remarkable things in terms of keeping the economy on track in these difficult times. We're not asking for money as a sector, um, but what we are asking for is just two um, interventions or changes to, to try and keep us moving in the right direction. And the first one of those is, is sort of a, 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 you got, we, we, we see it as a choice that we either level the playing field in terms of the um, the different market interventions and regulations affecting onshore renewables, because we're conscious that onshore renewables at the moment, despite its growth potential, is the, the only technologies which don't benefit from any financial support from the government. So if you're offshore, you, you can benefit from the CFD. If you're building other capacity, then there's a capacity market and that kind of thing out there. But for onshore renewables, it's very much you're out, out there on your own at the moment. So I guess what we're really encouraged by the fact that the CFD consultation is taking place which is, which is looking at the possibility of expanding the, the CFD into the onshore um, renewable space as well. Um, but I think that what we've got to be really conscious of is when we're, when we're considering that consultation is if onshore renewables, for whatever reason, are left outside of the CFD scheme and the capacity market scheme and, and any other um, sort of market interventions, then, then it's, we're, we're wholly reliant on the wholesale market. And as a consequence of the that every other technology being supported, the wholesale market um, becomes uh, a more and more distant relative of, of um, a, a capacity or a cost of capacity, and therefore it becomes a bigger and bigger barrier to build. So I think we really need to either either level the playing field or have a playing field which which um, is there for, for all technologies. And we really, uh, as part of the research, we have identified that just by providing price certainty, so not a high price or price support, but just um, just by providing price certainty, we could save the, the UK consumers 1.5 billion a year um, in terms of um, their electricity bills. And the other area um, which we just want to touch on is that the obviously since the 2015, there was a, a substantial change to national planning regulations, particularly in England, um, which just feels a little bit out of date now with 65% um, of local authorities declaring a climate emergency um and uh, and 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 yet as a consequence of the change in in planning policy we've seen an 86 percent drop off in planning applications so i think if we could just remedy the, the the essential block on onshore wind for the uk then that would make a big difference and we kind of catch up with the 
the 82 percent of the, the general public which support renewables and fully appreciate the need to address climate change so i guess just to conclude then um i guess there's a sense that during this you know, unique um financial or economic and health circumstances that, that we can't afford um the environmental targets um that, that to address the the climate emergency but i think the numbers demonstrate that actually um the the, the renewable space can deliver both the environmental imperative the economic opportunity and also the the investment opportunity that ultimately we need to build back better thanks very much thank you very much indeed uh, matthew uh, excellent perspective there and uh, it adds to the the opening remarks uh, that we had from david in the uk so, so we've heard now from two organizations who who have some very good information on the current challenges who have uh, ways they can help. I, I certainly agree uh, with you that the, the the ability of the renewable sector to contribute to the green bounce, the green recovery is clearly there. The, the, the ability of the sector to really significantly move the dial economically in terms of jobs, in terms of climate too, is all there. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for those for those opening remarks, and uh, we'll we'll certainly come back to you later with some some questions, I'm sure. Um, so um, next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a, a former colleague of mine uh, uh, from Scottish Enterprise. I was there running the uh, Renewable Energy Investment Fund for a while. Uh, worked closely with uh, Veronica and her team at that point. Um, so, so what I'd like to do now is ask uh, Veronica at noon, uh, who is the senior manager of the. Uh, Scottish Enterprise Low Carbon Transition Team uh, to make a few um, a few opening remarks, if you if you could, Veronica, and, and just let us know uh, what's uh, happening in, in terms of uh, Scottish Enterprise and and what your thoughts are about the current situation that we're in. Veronica, over to you. I think you may be just on mute, Veronica. I'm sorry. Indeed I am, and hopefully these slides will pop up. Are they popping up? Well, we can hear you. Your, your slides haven't hit the screen just yet. They've not hit the screen yet. Um, if they don't hit the screen soon, I'm just going to talk without them. How about that? Okay, well, I'll, I'll leave that to your own discretion. Okay, doke. Um, <laughs> Yes, so they were supposed to be hiding in the background. Um, they're not on full screen. Here um, we are. We can see them now, uh, Veronica. You You're can okay. See them. You can talk to them. Yes, uh, and I think if you can just say when you want to move on to the next mm -hmm. screen. So right now you've got your uh, opening slide up, and if you can just say when you want to move on to the next sleep screen, that's great. The team in the background will do that for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So I want you. to say. Right, a few words about some of the funding and finance that there is for low carbon technologies and projects. Um, but just before I do that, uh, I want to say a few words about what's going on with companies out there in the energy uh, and low carbon space. We know from our feedback from companies across the energy spectrum that COVID has had a mixed impact. Uh, for the low carbon heat sector, for instance, projects have been stalled because of construction being stalled, obviously. And with offshore wind, much of the necessary survey work has been held up and may well impact on projects in the longer term, hopefully not too much. But in some of the others, some of the emerging technologies, local energy systems, hydrogen and so on, where an awful lot are still at scoping and office stage, um, these are continuing to proceed uh, well. The challenge uh, in terms of investment um, was there before COVID, but it's been compounded by COVID. Um, and, you know, having looked at this with Andrew and others over the years, a number of just different challenges there across a whole range of low carbon technology technologies in almost all cases, there's a need for early stage risk capital with commercial deployment, a longer term opportunity. There is a substantial pipeline of projects uh, which will require support to get them to the stage where they have investable business cases. And there's a really a requirement which is being worked on and I think which we'll see coming through for a model to work with companies on projects on developing fundable business cases whilst also proactively working with investors to leverage private sector funding. So just on to the next slide. Um, 
I want to just talk through a number of areas, selective areas of support. I'm not going to go into the UK areas because David has already done that and he's circulated a link to lots of the UK supports. Um, firstly, I think as a, an SE representative, it would be remiss of me uh, not to mention the various supports that there are on offer for businesses affected by COVID-19 and indeed a lot of our support and the support of other organisations going into that website, um, which um, is a coordinated response across all agencies to help safeguard jobs and livelihoods there's a huge amount of information in there for anyone that hasn't already looked for um, company owners employers employees self-employed and so on um, SE also supports a range of R&D and innovation programs, including innovation centers such as the Construction Innovation Center, Data Lab. We also have sustainability specialists and our Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service practitioners, which help companies really to identify efficiency and associated carbon savings. And we work very closely with Scottish government agencies like Zero Waste Scotland on those programs. Um, the third one down um, I've, is a Scottish government-led uh, program, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Program, very much focused on, on projects and infrastructure. This provides a range of support from expert advice to financial support to assist the development and delivery of private, public and community low carbon projects across Scotland. Its main focus is really about assisting projects with business cases and also about developing business models which can be replicated. Um, that program has run a number of different calls. I think we're currently on the 11th call, which is just closed. There will be further calls. Uh, there's going to be a capital call for low carbon heat and energy systems later this year. The Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, CARES, is run by Local Energy Scotland and provides loans, grants and specialist advice. It encourages local and community ownership of renewable energy across Scotland and helps to maximise the benefits to communities of renewable energy systems, whether they're community owned or commercial projects. Um, I think the next one, uh, the uh, Scottish National Investment Bank, sorry I've jumped a couple, I'll go back to those. Um, is really going to be very significant for, for the future of this space. Um, it is going to be a mission-led organisation. The mission details are still being worked out, but they will cover just transition to um, zero by 2045, equal opportunities through improving place by 2040, and innovation to help companies flourish by 2040 as well. So they'll be the main drivers. And SE, working with the Scottish National Bank, uh, Investment Bank, are focused on delivering for the needs of Scotland's economy. They're fully aligned in this, uh, particularly around how SE and the bank can help accelerate the transition to a low-carbon economy. So we're working very closely with colleagues at the bank to create an integrated uh, financial service for system for Scottish business so that it's easy to access advice and information um, and, and easy to understand how all of the different finance mechanisms connect to one another. Just nipping back quickly to the Energy Investment Fund, a Scottish Government Fund, which is part of Scottish Investment Bank, which is Scottish Enterprises Investment Arm. It builds on the success of the Renewable Energy Investment uh, Programme and provides commercial investment for renewable and low carbon energy solutions. And SIB does all of that and more, um, but it also provides a financial readiness service, uh, which is really a team of experts that can help companies access advice and support around the finance that will suit them across equity funding and grants. Um, they can help identify growth funding requirements, source and raise the right growth funding from different sources. Um, and recently, um, Scottish Investment Bank got an additional 10 million for um, co-investment funds to help stimulate private investment. Uh, very briefly, because I know I'm probably running out of time, Energy Technology Partnership brings the universities together, uh, working at a different level on the R&D side. It provides significant sector support as well. Um, and as I said, I'm not really going to talk here about the UK. Um, programs because David's already done that and sent information out on those but I'm sure we can say more about those in the discussion. 
Finally, I, I wanted to finish on the green investment portfolio because this is about to be launched at the end of August, beginning of September by the Minister. Um, for some uh, projects out there, this may be another of the, the, the many ways you can use to help secure investment for your project or for your company. Um, it's not the only solution, but by being featured in this, this program or this portfolio of projects, projects will benefit from ministerial support, obviously, high quality marketing, having their profile raised internationally, and by presenting projects together, there's also this opportunity to bundle and achieve the scale that's requested by some funding, so by some funders. So this green investment portfolio is essentially a, a, a platform for projects to access international and other investment. And it will use SE and SDI and other networks across the world to ensure that investors are looking at these projects. The first of these will be launched at the end of this month, as I said, by the, the minister. There are, I think, nine, 10, pretty major projects within it, all of which have already been through some due diligence. Um, and uh, so, so we're, we're pretty convinced about the commercial viability of these projects. And as I say, this is going to be launched um, at the end of this month. As you can see in the pink um, uh, part of this, this presentation here, the pink box, we, we have um, a requirement that projects meet a whole range of green criteria. This is based on the EU uh, green taxonomy. The current portfolio is the first of a series. Uh, there's a much bigger database lying behind it with projects at very different levels of, of development. Um, some that need quite a bit more work before they are investable. The process will involve putting out calls from time to time to make sure that other projects are aware that this is this is going to be available for them. The first exercise identified projects which had not previously been on our radar and it showed that the vast majority of projects that came forward really needed additional support before they were investable propositions. Uh, several of those projects were uh, referred to other mechanisms, financial readiness, for instance. I mentioned the low carbon infrastructure transition program and, and R&D supports, um, which I think is just a nice way to close uh, because I think what we're seeing here is much more um, joined up thinking between the different sources of funding available across the public and the private sector. Um, I know we're going to get into a discussion about that soon, so I shall leave it there and hand back over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Veronica, um, for that whistle-stop tour of, of, of some of the, the, the key interventions that are available now. Um, what I would say, just from a perspective of having been involved, of course, uh, inside Scottish Enterprise, is the willingness to help and try and find a way, uh, clearly within the constraints of, of the individual schemes, is very strong. And I, I would urge everybody uh, to uh, have a good hard look at those various schemes, to engage with Scottish Investment Bank, to engage with the other programmes and, and really interrogate whether, whether help is available. Um, I, I dare say, uh, Veronica, people will be very interested in what else you may be able to tell us about the Green Investment Portfolio. That might come out through Q&A. Uh, I myself, through Green Backers, have uh, introduced a couple of businesses which I think might be included in the in a launch, we'll have to wait and see, but certainly an excellent new intervention, a great program. Thank you very much indeed, Veronica. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, is introduce our uh, next uh, speaker with some opening remarks. Um, uh, that's uh, Louise Wilson, who is uh, uh, Managing Director of Projects uh, Abundance Investment. And just a, a heads up to everybody in the audience, um, uh, Louise, during her presentation, when she gets to around the fourth slide or so, uh, we'll be introducing a poll um, and uh, we'd really like you to um, engage with that, uh, let us know what you think to the questions that are posed. Uh, but uh, without further ado, Louise, over to you. Great, thanks Andrew. Um, I did already share my screen, so I'm hoping that those are appearing, doesn't look like it. Ah, uh, yeah, there they are. Okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's good to be here this afternoon. Um, the All Energy um, Conference is a, is a highlight and a must um, of each year for Abundance and myself. So it was 
great sadness not to be there, but fantastic to be involved in this uh, digital way. So I'm just going to give a bit of perspective um, on how we see the world, if you like, from an abundance perspective and a bit of what we're also doing specifically at the moment. But just to begin with actually an overview of what we do, um, could we go to the next slide if I'm not driving that? I don't hold on one second. Here we go. Ah, I am driving. So at Abundance, we're on a mission, and, and that is to get as many people as possible positively engaged in the transition to low carbon through their money. So with just five pounds, people can invest in businesses and now local authorities because we have a new product um, that is just launched um, during lockdown. So it's been great to deliver that. And by putting five pounds to support those businesses and local authorities, then they become part of the solution. And by becoming part of the solution, not only are we mobilizing lots of money towards that, but also we mobilize those people. Um, and, uh, and actually, we know um, that very often the issue of climate emergency can leave people feeling a bit powerless and a bit helpless because of the scale of it. But as soon as you, you make them part of the plan and the way to get there, then actually uh, they go on to think about what else they can do over and above just the investment that they make through the platform. So in the, um, in the almost 10 years that we've been active, um, that's been over 100 million raised for uh, 40 different um, companies and local authorities in 16 different technologies from almost 7,000 investors. There's no doubt that the last five years with a shifting policy backdrop and the kind of stasis brought on by Brexit that uh, we could have gone much faster than that. But actually at the moment we really feel there is an incredible moment in time to be able to push ahead. Um, and that's what we are gearing up to do. Why do we feel so strongly about that? So there are many different surveys that I could have picked in terms of data points um, and an incredible array of grassroots movements that happened during 2019. But very much it feels like that climate crisis is now personal. And probably because as the Bayes um, survey shows on this slide, not only are 80% of people very concerned about the crisis, but it's because 70% of them say it's already affecting them. And having just come out of another um, exceptional week of heat last week, that number can only be getting higher. Um, and the good news for this sector is that actually people want to put their money to work doing something about it. And that's highlighted in this DFID survey. But actually, there have been a number of different insight um, works and research, research initiatives during 2019 and before. And also, this corroborates our own findings. But it doesn't really matter which way you ask the question. 70% of people want their money to help people and planet. And the same number certainly don't want it to harm people and planet. And then, of course, during 2019, we had this amazing and quite rare moment of leadership from a UK perspective where we were the first to put net zero uh, as a legislated objective for 2050 um, and has already been commented on with lots of different organisations and public sector bodies within the UK pushing for something much quicker than that. So that's been incredible in terms of 2019, despite some of the other challenging backdrop. And the pandemic... Um, my biggest fear when we came into this pandemic was that actually it would see climate move down the agenda. But actually, that's not what's happened. Uh, we were woefully underprepared for a pandemic that we knew was going to happen. Does that sound familiar? But it seems that actually that has very much been um, uh, the recognition across all corners of society. And therefore, the calls have been for the recovery to be green. And whether it's economists, academics, politicians, business and finance, um, a recognition that we cannot build back better if we don't build back greener. So that um, coincides with um, or has been driven, this recovery initiative, been driven by well over $9 trillion um, of uh, government and central bank funding. And um, that's a good moment now to pull up the poll because I'm really interested to know from this audience whether you want to see, whether you think it's right that we should have the same sort of public support to address climate emergency, or do you want business to lead that? Bearing in mind that actually this is probably the biggest, in fact, not probably, certainly the biggest economic opportunity ever in the history of society, 
um, to, um, to make that transition to low carbon. So I think at the moment where we are is a golden era of green opportunity. Um, I've talked already about the kind of course for green recovery. I'm sure that everybody on this um, listening into this webinar is probably aware of that. Um, but there's also finally a real shift within the world of finance. Uh, Matthew and I have stood feeling fairly lonely on many uh, conference platforms over the years with not many others who really tie uh, profit and purpose together in the world of finance. But ESG is now the biggest trend in, in the investment history. It's pretty patchy and it's still um, pretty few and far between in terms of there being really meaningful, properly um, ESG alternatives. But I think that's really going to accelerate from here. And therefore, all businesses within this sector against this call for a green recovery, we should be entering that golden age. And from our own perspective, um, our customers have been telling us that they want to support um, this transition with their, with their money. But we have also launched three different, very different investment propositions since lockdown, all of which um, are being well received. One was an anaerobic digestion um, business. The second is uh, some green social housing. And the third, which I mentioned in my first comments, was about um, a local authority, West Berkshire District Council, raising money to roll out solar panels across its estate. So we've got a, a great uh, pipeline beginning to build from here, although there's no doubt that um, some of the propositions that we've been looking at have been slowed. Um, Veronica referenced that in her remarks. But actually, if you're a business that is doing something towards that, that journey towards net zero and you're debt ready because we are a, um, a platform that raises debt. And when I say debt ready, that means you've got a clear path um, to know how you're going to satisfy the obligation to pay people's money back. Then um, we very much want to hear from you. That's it. Thanks, Andrew. Back to you. Excellent, Louise. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the, uh, the poll was indeed live and uh, the, uh, the results uh, are now in. Um, I, I, I uh, don't know if you wish to just um, have a look at those whilst uh, we have our last speaker uh, speaking and, and then come back to them to kick off our discussion or whether you want to get into them just now if you have time. How do you want to go with that? I don't mind. I can, I've just seen them come up. So we had 39% saying that gov governments and policymakers should do more. 15% um, to say business should take the lead and 45% saying both of the above. I guess in, in putting that question together, I kind of anticipated that C might be the leading answer, but actually it's quite close to um, governments and policymakers. So um, no pressure, Veronica. <laughs> but, um, but maybe I think my main comment is, um, you know, Matthew, I, I, I completely see how you've crafted a request to government that doesn't require any money. But I suppose the point that I can't quite get my head around is that if we're prepared to spend over $9 trillion to deal with this pandemic, which threatens millions of lives, how can we not afford a similar number or indeed a whatever number it takes to save hundreds of millions of lives and actually to protect just the very basics of our of our society. So I think I do feel that uh, that government policymakers absolutely can lead the way, but we'd love to see that business doesn't get crowded out. Indeed, and um, hold, hold that thought and, and um, let, let's um, let's hear uh, from Fraser, uh, Fraser Pritchard just now and, and then let's get back into that. Uh, um, Louise, as always, uh, some thought-provoking remarks, and thank you very much indeed for those. Um, uh, what I'd like to do now is, is introduce uh, uh, my, my final excellent panelist um, uh, for, for some opening remarks, and, and that is uh, Fraser Pritchard. Fraser is a, a partner in uh, Columbus Energy Partners. Again, all of Fraser detail, Fraser's details are, are on the All Energy website. Please go there uh, to find out more uh, about him. Uh, Fraser, I'd like to pass over to you for your opening remarks, please. Thank you. Uh, well, th thank you, uh, Andrew, and also Judith Elleron today for the kind introductions and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm just about to share my screen, so uh, hopefully um, this comes through for you all.
So, um, yeah, I think I think that's shared now. So, as Andrew said, my name is Fraser Pritchard. I'm one of the partners within the uh, within the Columbus Energy Partners group of companies. Uh, very honoured to be speaking with you this afternoon uh, to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities uh, for the finance of of energy projects and larger businesses. Um, these are exciting times, as our other speakers have said uh, this afternoon, uh, in order to expand uh, renewable energy as well as accelerate the energy transition within the existing energy sector. Our, our company works with both startup and underperforming companies across the sector, and my short talk today, four or five minutes or so, will expand upon the earlier speakers and highlight some of our own experiences and some of our recommendations as to what we feel are the key ingredients for the smart funding of energy companies. I'll just move on to the next slide. I'm sure you can see that. Um, I'm just going to speak to, there's quite a lot, there's quite a lot of, it, of information on the slide. I'm really going to cover uh, the discussion highlights, which are on the top left and refer to, to some of the, the actual diagrams. So, um, so, so with this context, I would like to briefly mention some, some of our own opinions based upon our experiences, and then obviously the panel um, can expand them further. Um, as I said, I put a few points together in my slide and in the images, and I would like to mention some, some of these in the short time we have as the ingredients um, uh, we see to be fundamental for smart investment into energy companies. Looking at the image in the top right, the pie chart, um, the first ingredient we we, we need for smart investment is addressing the, the blockers and the impediments for businesses to become successful. Many, if not most of us, believe there's more capital out there than there, than there are op opportunities. Um, and we do feel the blocker to access in any capital really comes down to, to addressing the weaknesses in the various companies seeking um, investment. Uh, from the many companies that we, we, we work with over the last 10 years or so and, and plus, um, we, we generally see that a lot of companies focus more on technology rather than um, how that technology is going to be commercial. Now, what, what I mean by this is uh, a lot of companies, the focus is more on optimizing the technology near, near term at the loss of looking at how the business is going to be commercial long term. So what does this mean? This means knowing where are the various markets for selling the, the technology, it also means who are the best partners and suppliers needed to support these markets, as as David mentioned at, at the start of the uh, uh, start of the webinar, and also more more importantly, how the company is going to be successful in many locations, not just in the UK but outside the UK. Our experiences show that companies not only need to strengthen their business cases, as quite a few speakers have said today, to secure investment, but they also need to demonstrate their uh, their uh, commercial leadership, their knowledge of many markets to sell their products and services in, um, their understanding of the different channels to generate revenue from those markets, and also the effect of governance they need to replicate their operations into many, many um, regions and uh, other countries. The pie chart in my slide in the top left, uh, sorry, in the top right, some summarizes our, our, our main learnings on what the blockers to raise investment uh, are. As you can see, about half of the blockers are due to insufficient commercial leadership and weak uh, business cases, which is in the sort of green, the, shade, the shades of green. And the other half in the sort of orangey colors um, are really represent companies not fully un understanding the markets they're trying to sell into what channels and partners they need to access those markets and the governance needed to ensure they have profitable revenue. In working with uh, companies, our, our firm pushes companies at, at all stages of their growth, not only just to optimize the technology, but, but also the commercial direction needed to access, access the markets for the company to be s successful. And I have mentioned in the image in the lower left, some some of the direction and some some of the needs we think com companies need to focus on depending upon the stage uh, of life that their company is in, whether it be startup or growth, um, and so on. Our, our view is if companies can address all, all of these blockers, then securing investment, especially in these difficult times, will de-risk de the business and make it more um, attractive for funding. 
The second point I wanted to make, or the second ingredient we feel is uh, needed for smart investment, is promoting not just the technology or the service solution, but how that solution fits into the wider energy ecosystem. Uh, for many years, we have seen companies optimize a specific te technology and have a uh, large difficulty trying to commercialize that technology, not, not just in the home market, but in international markets also. This, this however, is only part of the challenge as, as investors customers, suppliers will desire and indeed expect to see how every company complements with other companies in, in, in the wider energy sector. So, so we feel that to build, grow and sustain businesses, we all have to show all stakeholders, the owners, the customers, the investors, the suppliers, the, the actual communities and the general public, what are the best forms of energy and technology needed in, in any location and how each company services that location. This approach we feel demonstrates to investors that every company is not just a standalone business, but is also able to integrate into the wider energy supply and customer market. This means that each company needs to be part of a larger circular energy system so, um, and uh, with in interlinks to others, as, as David also mentioned at the start of this afternoon, and that allows the company and therefore the investors to access more markets and more customers. Um, the, the image in the lower right, for, for example, aims to show how different energy, um, different energy solutions, whether it be solar, wind, marine generation, battery storage combined, heat, heat and power, should and all must fit together. This is an onshore example, but there are plenty of examples um, of, offshore as well. So, we, so we believe the ingredients to smart funding of energy companies really comes down to two key uh, ingredients or, or two key factors. The first one is namely selling a very robust and diverse business case and especially focusing on how you will deliver it because we tend to find that we tend to see a lot of business cases don't really address how they will be actually de um, actually deployed. And the second factor we feel is extremely important is selling the business as part of a wider circular energy ecosystem. Um, so to wrap up, uh, just a, a strap line to sort of wrap up, um, we feel that sustainable investment needs uh, sustainable companies, but companies will only be sustainable if they can show to investors that, that there are multiple ways for the company to actually be to actually be commercial. Um, so thank you for listening to my short presentation and I now hand back to Andrew for the panel discussion. Thank you. Fraser, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, an excellent perspective there on, on what companies can do for themselves. Um, and we've heard earlier, of course, uh, uh, about the many sources of, of help that, uh, that are available. Um, uh, to our audience, I'd just like to say um, thanks for listening so far. This is where you have to do a little bit of work, please, if you will, uh, by uh, composing and, and, and lodging questions uh, through the facility online. And um, we will uh, attack those um, as we can. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is um, uh, pick up on some of the themes that came through from the the presentations and throw some questions around um, and rather than all of us commenting on every question just to keep the flow going I'd like to uh, allocate a question to somebody of course feel free to to jump in any of you as, as we go um, and Louise what I'd like to do is start with, with you and, and just go back to that, that poll I, I was very interested myself to see uh, that um, uh, a fairly small 15 percent um, thought uh, the, the, the most important thing perhaps was for uh, governments uh, to, to create the policy environment that allows businesses to act quickly. Um, I, I wonder if you'd like to um, give me your thoughts on that particular finding and, and, and whether that surprises you or, or, or whether that's in, in with your expectations. Um, so, yeah, so I guess I definitely thought that C would get the most um, support. Um, uh, and I suppose I did feel that partly with the way I'd phrased the question that that A would also get people answering that one. Um, but, you know, I was just looking at a, an FT article this morning talking about the challenger banks, digital challenger banks, and how they are being held back by support that was given to the big banks in 2016. So always there's an issue whenever you have too much um, big state intervention that uh, actually it, it helps the incumbents uh, and doesn't so much help 
you know, it's not necessarily helpful for competition. So I don't know whether that was in people's mind when they were answering that, but I do think it's very much a genuine concern. Um, but I also think that, you know, this is this is a much bigger threat than the pandemic, um, although hopefully the pandemic is serving as a very kind of pointed reminder um, of of actually the fact that, and also a demonstration of what we can do when we put our minds to it. Um, and certainly one of the things that uh, we've been discussing with our customers is, you know, do they think that uh, we should all be doing our bit, you know, whether we're an individual, a business um, a policymaker, whoever it may be, or should we be doing what we can? Mm. And actually, the very clear message that came back from our customers as individuals is it's not just doing our bit, it's doing what we can. And whether mm. that's kind of from a global level, you know, the, um, the more developed nations have much more ability to do more than the underdeveloped nations and actually have a responsibility, I think, to do that, not just because it's good for you know, it's good for them, but actually, you know, if we don't act, if we don't throw everything at this um, issue, then we really risk some very dire consequences. So um, I think I'm still in the, I'm in the camp of both of the above and all the way down mm. to the individual level. Yeah, 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 it, it, interesting. I, my, my own view um, is that people ask uh, governments, agencies such as SE, and others for, for money all the time, and I, I think um, often it, it's it's better to ask for things that are uh, more deliverable sometimes than than just money. And I do think uh, that we need some some changes to policy uh, would be the way I would see it. But I, one of the other things uh, that I'd like to pick up on and and, and perhaps uh, pass to uh, to uh, David um, is is the. Uh, the strong statements that we've heard from many, many businesses, some of them huge businesses, uh, particularly the oil majors, for example, uh, about the net zero ambitions by 2040, 2039, even 2030, and how those big macro announcements uh, could be used by those who are looking for funding at a business level or a project level as they as they head out on that, that really difficult journey. And I wonder if you've got a, a David, if you could give us a little perspective uh, about the, the use, if you will, of the, the climate crisis, these ingredients that we have before us right now, and how they can actually be applied to individual projects and, and businesses. And, and I'd maybe ask one or two of you to comment on that, please. But David, first you. Yeah, no problem. So um, I, I think we're starting to see more substantive um, movements from the likes of the oil majors. I think previously some of the criticism that there's been an extent of greenwashing has probably been true. I think BP's announcement recently was probably the most ambitious thing we've seen and actually should be really welcomed. Um, and what was really interesting about that is actually I think their share price spiked by something like 7% on the day that they made the announcement. So it's indicative that being sustainable and pursuing a clean energy transition is no longer just an idealistic thing it's something which people think is an investable proposition as well and and that can kind of be applied across all sorts of businesses i think um as louise was saying is this is an issue for everyone and really that's one of the great things about the climate challenge is there is a role for everyone in um, in achieving what we need to. And from a business perspective, people are starting to be aware that um, their choices are, are driven by the ethics of the companies that they're, they're investing in as well. So I, that's definitely something which everybody can get behind from our perspective on our projects individually. Um, we do have partnerships with some of the old oil majors and things. Shall have set up an investment um, accelerator, which is useful as well. And sometimes they even partner with some of the new technology companies that we invest in as well. So um, generally positive moves, I think. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Uh, in a moment, Fraser, I'll come to you with one of the questions that's, uh, that's in the box. But um, it, what I'd like to do, Matthew, is just get your comments on, on that issue of, of the best way of individual projects, individual business owners using this current momentum that Louise was referring to 
in, in, in support for for renewables and support for a green bunch. How do they capture that in their presentations to potential investors, to people like you, in a way that resonates with you? Yeah, I mean, I think largely if a if a, a renewables project comes to to us or a number of people around the table, then that that door, yeah, there's it's already. Uh, an inbuilt appreciation of what they're doing and, and the anticipation of what they're doing. But I think more in, you know, more broadly in the more conventional market, if you like, I think what's, what's you know, it, it's about risk, basically, in that if you are pursuing a conventional fossil-based or fossil fuel-based trajectory, then you've got a short-term business model. Um, and I think that is that is that risk perspective and the longevity of the business, which, which people look at. And I think that the markets are, are beginning to wake up to that, and I think yeah, what what we've seen on the green bond side. I mean, there is yeah, there's, yeah uh, from from our very green perspective, there's a lot of greenwash in the green bond market, um, but that's a yeah, that's multiple billion pound market every year now. Um, the green bond market, and there's some yeah, you know, on the surface of things, you see some very large organisations which you wouldn't associate with high environmental performance in those. Um, you know, launching and, and sponsoring those, those green bonds. But what, what is happening is there are specific interventions that those bonds are, are funding within organisations which maybe have, have more dubious um, yeah, uh, activities. So I think that, yeah, that the whole market's waking up to the fact that if you're going to look at something very long term, then you've got to be looking at how it's going to perform environmentally and how it contributes to a positive change. And I think... Uh, Dare I say, I mean, I'm not a stock trader or anything, but I think what, what we've seen with Tesla shares, it's not that people are investing in a great, you know, an organization which provide, which produces amazing batteries or amazing vehicles. It's more that they are an example of a business which is engaged with where we need to get to. And I think that more and more we'll see that across the market, that, 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 that you're being on the right trajectory uh, and, and, and doing that just gives you, you know, that that's the longevity, the stability, which people need to see. So I think that it's that, so that you know, you've already de-risking if you're engaging with the transition. Mm, yeah, and Matthew, I, I, I can only agree with uh, with those remarks. And, and, and just uh, as a hand over to, to, to Fraser, I, I, I'd just like to um, make the point that individual businesses can, uh, can capture all of that by very carefully and thoroughly understanding exactly what in their offering uh, does relate to to carbon reduction, d does relate to to the green recovery. I capture that, have it independently assessed if, if possible, but certainly make sure it's included in any investor presentation. So, Fraser, um, we, we've had uh, some 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 interest in in, in, in your comment uh, that, that companies tend to over focus on technology and, and I very much agree with that comment Fraser I have to say you know rather than on commercial viability and I wonder if, if you can provide any you know brief examples from your own background and experience of that kind of thing just to illustrate it for our, for our audience today. Okay thanks Andrew and uh, and for the question. Um, I can certainly give an answer as regard to the themes um, rather than name any particular companies. Uh, as you would appreciate under confidentiality I can't but I think it comes down to two key things because I think the worst thing is first thing is with regard to the funding. A lot of technology companies whether it be spin-outs from universities or, or it's a good idea etc are generally funded in the short term through a variety of grants, public funds, um, small uh, small investors, whereby the focus sort of corrals you and tends to pincer you into developing the product or making the product, you know, optimised in a slightly a slightly different way. And then the commercial thing is the commercial focus is then tied on at the end. And I think um, so. I think, so I think the, the the source of finance is probably, or the source of pub, public finance certainly has a, a push more on technology rather than the actual commerciality of the business. I think also we are all very, very, very well aware of the um, the uh, parameters behind technical readiness level, which have been around for many, many years now, from you know le level one, the idea, through to level nine, um, whereby your product has been field trialed and you're ready to scale up. I think what I've seen or what, what we have seen is less common is you have some view of commercial readiness because our view is the technology readiness and the commercial readiness has to go hand hand in hand 
but that, and and making sure that the leadership of a business has complementary skills from from like both sides because because you can't really spend four or five years with a variety of grants etc trying to develop a technology and then try and go to market we, we feel feel totally that you have to do both actually together because one you de-risk the technology and 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 you you will eventually um um you know, bring in that pri private investment in order to reduce the um, the onus on the actual public um, on the actual pub public finance. So I would say those are my two key reasons as to or two key examples as to where why I think there's an over focus on tech. You muted that, Andrew. We did we bring me in. Sorry, I was. Uh, you, you've got my body language perfectly yeah. correct. Well done. So, yeah, uh, I, yeah, do I completely agree with that. But I'd, I'd, um, I'd go a little bit further as well. As I think some of those commercial models traditionally haven't been great in the energy sector because there hasn't been a focus on knowing your customer, and that's probably because historically energy provision was looked at on a levelized cost of energy and a lot of energy provision was very centralized so you didn't really have to know your customer now we're moving to more distributed system and people are becoming more engaged we need to start taking this approach of people designing things from the outset based on the needs of the consumer um, in the same approach that is taken in the tech sector yeah, okay. That, I mean, I think that's a, a, a very, very good point. Thanks. I'd just like to move on, Veronica, to a, a question I'd like to, to put to you particularly um, uh, around uh, what, what adaptations you're seeing in, in, the, in the public sector. Yes, clearly in your part of it, but, but through connections you have, uh, the wider public sector, uh, what adaptations are you seeing uh, uh, to the current situation and, 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 and just how would you suggest businesses best engage with the public sector now to achieve the best result for themselves and their and their projects? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Nice, nice, simple one. <laughs> I think um, just very quickly, just to go back to the the previous point, I, I would have to agree with both speakers. Um, I think the low carbon infrastructure transition program was a bit of an object lesson in that 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 great gap there is between the technology readiness and the commercial readiness, and lots of lessons been learned around that. I think, um, but there is that 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 kind of um, risk capital that is required to help move. Uh, companies from that 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 position of of technology technology readiness through to to commercial readiness, um, absolutely. Uh, in terms of adaptation of the public sector, I think what we're seeing is um, a very strong push for. Um, uh, we're in recovery mode now, very much so. Or, or we think we are. That's that's the phase that 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 that, that we think we are in in the public sector, um, and. What I think that means is that we need to revise just about everything that we're doing in line with that that uh, that recovery. And the Scottish government talks increasingly about the climate change plan now being the green recovery plan. Um, and I think what that is sends out is a signal that that you know all of the instruments that that are on offer are going to be diverted into that 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 kind of area and going to be more joined up and integrated uh, i mentioned earlier the, the the scottish national infrastructure um investment bank rather snib um, that is all about working across the public sector and in terms of creating a, a funnel if you like an integrated financial services accessible to businesses out there and i think we have learned an awful lot over the last few years about the need to be clear about what's on offer and how how there is a requirement for a continuum of different types of support depending on where a project or a company is in terms of their development. Um, yeah. So, so we're seeing that kind of adaptation. What was the second part of the question, Andrew? Um, just how, how, how best can companies really engage with that adaptation to, to get the best result for them, um, just some practical uh, practical advice. And then another easy part of the question there, Veronica. Well, I think that 
businesses can engage through the different organizations there there are out there they can keep themselves informed and the public sector can help do that um, they uh, need to engage through effective business planning and one of the things that, that has been an issue um, in the past with companies with some of the companies that come forward is you know quite frankly when you ask for a business plan even though sometimes there's support out there to de develop one they, they disappear at that point and you don't see them for quite some time afterwards and it's really important to get that bit of it right and to take the advice at that point and and, and have that dialogue and have that discussion similarly with business cases uh, they need to be absolutely uh, spot on as well. They need to be defensible in the sense that they are able to set out what the market is uh, for for their particular service and how defensible that is in terms of, you know, um, they have the IP, they uh, know that yeah. they are very competitive so that we actually have that information very, very clearly. So I think it's kind of honest dialogue. The public sector has its role there in terms of making sure that it's accessible and responsive um, and, and companies have their role in terms of really trying to enter into dialogue taking the advice where, 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 where they're asked to obviously the businesses are coming in with all the great ideas that public sector aren't necessarily going to have those so um, a, a whole range of different factors really yeah indeed and um, Matthew I'm just going to come to you shortly with a, a kind of quick fire question if I may but uh, I, you know I would just endorse the the preparation um, for fundraising, for engaging with uh, all the potential sources of funding, uh, detailed preparation should be as thorough as possible. It, it should be as thorough as preparing for a complex engineering operation, uh, lots of planning, uh, lots of scenario planning, and, and often that, that is indeed, uh, indeed missing. And Matthew, we had a specific question I'm just going to throw to you, please, for a fairly brief comment about the stage uh, when onshore wind is typically uh, uh, finance when that finance is put in place and, and the question is is that typically pre or post planning um, I think it's an evolving picture I think that there's an acknowledgement that in the the post subsidy world if you want to call it that then there are there are there is um, there is public money available for that that pre for that feasibility and business planning stage, and the low carbon hubs in the in the in England and Wales um, are doing that, and um, and the team here yeah, are also doing that in the Scottish context. So I think there is there is public support for that phase. Um, I think if there's a portfolio approach, then there's private capital available for a portfolio. I think you're unlikely to get funding to go for to take one site into planning but if you've got a, a number of sites that you're exploring or you know a business plan or, um, in that context then there is yeah, there's private money available to do that um, and I guess what's really changed and, and what we've seen in the, the drop-off with with projects going into planning is that just that that long-term revenue certainty principally um, has evaporated and I think what's what's really important for projects considering how you know how to present their projects and what the opportunity really is is to, to be working um, very hard on, on what that revenue model looks like because it's no longer just well we'll get it qualified and then we'll get we'll get a rock or a bit um, and, and off we go um, we really have to think about what options we've got so you know, a number of our projects for instance our private wire where we're delivering um, power directly to industrial hosts um, which which meets a nice happy uh, midpoint between what they can import for and what we can export for typically um, I think there's increasing pressure on the, um, the, the the traders and the utilities to stretch out the power the, the, the power trading horizon. Effectively, you know, when when I was trading electricity uh, 18 years ago, then you know, we were routinely trading five, ten years ahead. Um, and now you're lucky if you can trade two to three years ahead. Um, and that makes a big difference when you're making a capital-intensive, long-term investment decision. So I think. Really, just trying to, to to create as much certainty as you can around a project um, is, is really important. That's where I was trying to come from with the presentation. It's about you know, we either the support we need from the government is either through um, certainty or um, the ability to make decisions on the fundamentals. So we need to stop jigging things around and making tweaks and interventions, or we need to leave it to the market. But the, the hybrid of the two is quite a difficult place to make long-term investment decisions in. Indeed. Veronica, you wanted to come in with a brief remark there. Yeah, uh, really just around the certainty. Um, 
And I think policy certainty can, can help there. But also when we consider the decentralization of, of energy that's been happening, that, that local energy planning could help as well. I think that really could make quite a difference to all of this. I know that the Scottish Government have been looking at local heat and energy efficiency plans and piloting those. But this idea of a broader local energy plan that actually looks at the current supply and the demand and the different options actually would provide some of the certainty and some of the, I suppose, the help around how that fits in in terms of town planning as well, town and regional planning as well, because sometimes projects can feel that they're operating in a bit of a vacuum there, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really, yeah that, that's really reflected in the situation in England with the you know, change in national planning guidance around onshore wind only being able to be considered in areas which have the renewables you know embedded into their their, their local local planning or the local plan and um, a lot of those local plans have a 30-year cycle so they were written before renewables was a thing yeah. Um, yeah. and so yeah we really need to just really just yeah use the, the the momentum we've got with the the levels of climate or the number the 65 percent of uk local authorities um you know be, uh, announcing their cli the climate emergency then empower them to do something about it yeah in, in, indeed indeed well um a, a, a panelists th thanks very much for those those remarks I, i'm just going to take a, a question or two from the uh from the audience uh, very quickly but whilst i do that i i'd just like you to think about your uh your closing positive uh, pieces of, of advice, your bon mots, as it were, for for those companies, those those projects who are listening to us right now, and who are thinking, you know, how, how can I use this terrible situation to to my benefit? How, how can I adapt? And you know, what can I do? And I'm going to have to restrict you to a minute only on that now, please, uh, because we've had a, a great discussion. Uh, before I, I I come to you, there's a couple of questions. Um, uh, that I'd just like to respond to quite quickly, if I may, using a chairman's privilege. One is about uh, measures uh, to be put in place for attracting international private investment for Scottish and indeed UK projects. Um, and I think all I'd like to say there, from my own experience, is uh, in, in Scotland, Scottish Development International, indeed the uh, uh, UK, the Department for International Trade, are, are very good at, at bringing in um, international investment and Veronica you mentioned the green investment portfolio which is about to be launched um, in Scotland um, and I believe SDI Scottish Development International have had some strong input into that and, and that's certainly a mechanism for attracting international investment and of course the, the other parts of the UK have, have their, their schemes regrettably I'm not as familiar with those but, but they will have them um, so, so there are schemes there um, to try to try and help that there is a specific query uh, which I'm not going to land on you, uh, Veronica, about Business Gateway. All I would suggest is that I acknowledge that's there and perhaps uh, we can arrange for you to respond to that um, uh, after the event. It's, it, it's really quite specific. Um, but just to let the audience member know that, that that's there and we'll, we'll certainly deal with that. So, in a, in a minute each, please, what I'd like to do, starting, Fraser, with you and then just going a, a, across the screen, uh, for, for, for a, a bon mot, something, something positive you'd like to give to our audience uh, uh, around this situation and, and what they can do, what they can take out of it to, to improve their prospects of, of securing the funding and finance that they need. Fraser. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I think it really comes down to one thing, and that is really to stress test and to de-risk their, their uh, business case. I mean, we tend, it doesn't really matter if it's impacted by um, COVID as we've seen this year or before. A lot of big business cases down the years I see is, you know, p companies very clearly define what they're going to do but not how they're going to do it. And I think we've seen certainly in the last six months with a variety of countries, if not most countries in forms of lockdown, they're using this time to, to de-risk the business model, to look at their supply chains, to look at their investors, to better understand their markets, and really to, to, to remove the risk from the business cases. Because it's a bit similar to what I said in my presentation. The capital was there if uh, you need it, but you have to convince people to actually give you the capital. And if you have a very good business case, covers all the different scenarios in the markets, the investors, your suppliers, yeah, indeed, then indeed. you will actually get the capital. And, um, some, some thoughts uh, from you, David, please. I think you're on mute, David. 
Um, simply build relationships and take people on the journey with you. And people um, prefer to have had this relationship build over the course of you developing your technology or project rather than to become at the 11th hour cap in hand. So do that. And I think there's good cause for optimism. I think we might look back in 10 years time and see this as being the opportunity for a huge stimulus, both public and private, to um, make the difference that we need to against climate change. Well, very encouraging remarks. I, I, certainly, hope, I certainly hope that is the case. I, I certainly think there is um, enough positivity around to, to suggest that will be the case. Um, Matthew, uh, your own your own closing thoughts, please. Yeah, I guess I've got a couple. I mean, the first one is, I guess, debt's never been so cheap. Um, so use it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a market out there. The, the, the rates, even for relatively modest scale projects, are out there. Um, so use that. Um, to echo the other points, yeah, absolutely. It's all about de-risking your project. We appreciate the market's moved a lot. The context has changed a lot. But de-risk your project where you can. Um, make the most of the public consciousness, awareness, and support, which hasn't been around for a while. Um, to make the most of that evolving situation. But I think the other thing, just to really, like, you can't underestimate, is you're not alone. You know, the whole value chain that's been built up, the whole sort of contractual and expertise infrastructure that's been put together in the last 15, 20 years in the renewables, want to make this work, in addition to the environmental imperative. So work with people. You know, if every part of the value chain wants a market to work in and believes where it needs to go. So have the conversations, work with people, and find the ways to make it work. Indeed, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Matthew. And and Veronica, your own your own uh, closing thoughts um, uh, on the uh, on the current situation. Um. Yeah, I would say that amidst the so the, the, the gloom, um, and, and actually there's quite a few positives around that that, that that people have talked about, but we have, for instance, the biggest leasing round just announced in Scottish waters for a decade for offshore wind. That's really good news. We've got some of the building blocks being put in place for low carbon heat and heat decarbonisation. And also, I thought, the reintroduction of onshore wind into the CFD system. So there are some positives that are there for businesses as well. But in terms of, you know, business, individual businesses coming forward, I think the business, the business plan is really important. It needs to be as accessible as possible. Um, it needs to, 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 to be able to defend its space in the marketplace. Um, and all of those good things that everybody else has talked about, I think. Um, so there are some positives, there are some things that people can build upon. Um, and I think it's about entering that spirit, that spirit of the green recovery and actually beginning to use the language of that and being able to, to, to articulate and understand how they fit in. It's back to that, mm -hmm. everybody has a part to play. Yeah, but here, here. And, and Louise, um, perhaps uh, some, some final closing remarks from you, please. Yeah, well, um, I have to agree with what everybody has said already, so it doesn't leave me much more to add to that. But um, but maybe just to kind of, you know, I, I put up that slide that said, is this a golden era of green investment? Um, I, I do think it's absolutely there, notwithstanding the challenges that um, we've got in this immediate time frame. Um, and if you have an investable project, then, um, and I stress that point, you know, to, to some of the comments that um, all the other speakers have picked up on, um, then we, we want to talk to you. And, um, and I can point to lots of examples where having individuals invested in your project just somehow makes everybody that more focused on getting it over the line and fixing the problems and remembering that this is about more than just the money and very much that's where our customers come from. They want to see indeed. the stuff get uh, done. Well, thank you. Well, dogs and children. Oh, dogs and children. That was perfectly timed. Um, I, I just like to... Call, to calling an end. <laughs> well, that's exactly the, the, the time we've reached. I'd just like to take... Uh, the final minute or so of the afternoon to say a big thank you to you all, Fraser, David, Matthew, Veronica and Louise uh, for, for, for joining um, the panel today, for making it such a great discussion and uh, thanks for all your, your positive remarks. I'd also like to thank um, uh, on our behalf all Energy and the support team 
uh, behind the scenes who, who made this all work, uh, notwithstanding our best efforts to sabotage it, including my own. Um, and, and I would just direct everybody who's watching to the resources on the All Energy website. You, you'll see the presentations, you'll see the links. I apologize to those who've lodged questions we've not been able to get to. We'll certainly do our best to answer any pressing issues separately and we'll work with the All Energy team for that. But in the meantime, thanks again to the panel, thanks for attending, and goodbye from us. Thank you. Thank you.